Hi there, my name is Peter Wheelhauer. I'm a professor of political science at Western Michigan University. In this series of videos, I'm going to be talking about quantitative political analysis, which is especially geared toward my students in my data and politics and policy class. But the content here is going to be good for anybody who is interested in understanding the role of data quantitative analysis in political science and in social sciences generally. Anybody who's taken a political science course would know that empirical political science is really broad. And, and by empirical, I'm talking about research that's based on uh, empirical observations, that's based on data analysis, uh, based on observations, rather than the kind of political science that's based on uh, observ uh, arguments and discussions about normative concepts. So in this case, we're gonna be talking about the kinds of research projects that involve data at some level. So for example, my area of expertise is in er elections, politics, campaigning, and so forth. When we're talking about the research that we're doing, we're dealing with a lot of different questions related to a broad range of political behaviors. For example, some of the research questions that people like me study is why do people vote? Why do some people vote rather than other people? Why do some people not vote? How do people develop their political preferences? Now, sometimes the questions about how preferences develop can be theoretical. For example, the very influential book, An Economic Theory of Democracy by Anthony Downs, develops a theory of preference formation, but doesn't test it. So when we're talking about empirical political science, we're talking about research that evaluates and assesses uh, and tests ideas about how preferences develop, not just make reasonable conclusions or arguments about how we think they might develop. We could look at research about how, what are the effects of election laws. And here we're talking about actual studies about the effects of election laws, changing the election laws, such as requiring a photo ID, rigorous enforcement of voter ID, making registration easier or harder, and so forth. As opposed to simply arguing about whether we should have those laws, empirical political science attempts to figure out, does it really matter? What are the actual effects of these kinds of changes? How does the current context of political polarization affects the president's ability to get his or her agenda passed through Congress? This is a different question than arguing about whether they, the president's agenda ought to be passed. This is more looking at the current state of public opinion and political conflict and evaluating what actually happens to the likelihood that a president's bills or preferred pieces of legislation will pass. Another area of political science that's really common is international relations, and this deals with politics in the international and the global sphere. So research in this area might ask, under what conditions do nations go to war? So we could look actually at the, the measures that are related to interpersonal conflict one of the uh, international conflict, conflict between nations. And of course, one of the key questions here is, what is war? How do we actually define war? Is it merely the formal declaration of war or is it an actual armed conflict? And if it's actual armed conflict, how much conflict is necessary for a, a conflict to be classified as a war as opposed to an insurgency or a, a mere conflict or, or border clash? Another area might be in the realm of foreign aid. Does foreign aid affect economic development? That is, does uh, receiving foreign aid from a country such as the United States or the International Monetary Fund, does that actually influence whether or not a country develops economically and advances itself? What about the effects of international organizations? Does the United Nations involvement in a particular conflict or in a particular issue actually have an effect? Uh, does, is that effect positive? So we can look at the way that international organizations operate and we can evaluate what, they, what the consequences are of those actions. Finally, just to pick one of many areas of policy interest, we can look at the question of climate change and environmental policy generally. A couple of different ways that, that climate change might enter into empirical political science research, for example, is asking why climate change policy differs in different locations. When you go from one state to another state, environmental policy is different. When you go to one nation 
from another nation, the two nations might have different policies. So why is that the case? What kinds of political characteristics or uh, governance systems might account for why climate policy is different in different locations? Another area might relate public opinion to the question of climate change. So some people believe in anthropogenic climate change, that is that humans are causing and exacerbating climate change, and other people don't believe that. Why is it that some people believe that and other people don't? What kinds of characteristics do they have? What kind of media sources are they using? What kind of political affiliations might they have? So these are the uh, kinds of questions where we can integrate the relationship between public uh, politics and public policy. This is certainly just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the number and kinds of questions we ask, but it does give you a sense of the real breadth that empirical political science is, uh, is, use, is studying. Now, in the context of developing political science, empirical political science, it's worth talking about in general the different kinds of political knowledge that exist, because not all knowledge is scientific knowledge. Sometimes it's moral knowledge or conceptual knowledge or theoretical knowledge. But when we're here we're talking about political knowledge that is based on empirical research. But it's not the only kind of knowledge that's out there. So it's worth acknowledging that different kinds of political knowledge and claims exist. I think there are three main types. The first kind is description. That is, you have facts about who, what, how much, when, those kinds of things. So we can ask about who is the president, who won the election, what was spent on defense spending last year, how much money was spent in, uh, in campaign finance law, and so forth. A second kind of political knowledge is prescription or normative knowledge. And these deal more with questions about what's right or ideal in a particular situation. So these might be questions about morality and not just what do people think about morality or how do they, how does their morality influence what they do? That's an empirical question. Instead, we're here talking about what actually is right, what actually is ideal. So here we might think about should a nation, is it ever justifiable to go to war? Should there be public input into important policy questions such as in a democracy? Those kinds of questions about what ought to be in a political context, that's prescriptive knowledge. We make claims about what we think we know, not based on empirical research, but instead based upon our notions and our theories about what is right and wrong. A third kind of political knowledge is explanation. That is, not just what ought to be uh, and what happened, which is prescription and description, but how did those things come about? Why did one thing happen instead of another thing? So if we're talking about the 2020 election, for example, description would be this number of votes was cast, this candidate won. Prescription would be, is this the best kind of political system in the current political environment? Explanation would be, why did it come about that Donald Trump lost the election and Joe Biden won the election? How did that process work? And so those kinds of questions are different than uh, d mere description and different from notions of right and wrong. They're, def they're definitions and their discussions about how we can know that something came to pass so that we can understand the, not just the past, but also maybe make projections into the future. Now, some political knowledge is based on quantitative analysis, that is the use of data in its development. Description sometimes is. So how many votes did Donald Trump get? How many votes did Joe Biden get? How much money was spent in the election and so forth? That's quantitative data. But simply who won the election? That's not a quantitative question. That is a qualitative question. That's just a mere fact about who did something. Now, in our analysis, as we develop and mature in our ability to do quantitative analysis, we'll find that some of these, these categories, such as answers to the who question, Donald Trump versus Joe Biden, can be translated into quantitative values for the purpose of quantitative analysis. But at its core, who won the election is not a quantitative question. How many votes they won, that is.
Moreover, when we talk about prescriptive or normative knowledge, it's rarely the case that prescriptive or normative knowledge or claims are based on quantitative analysis. I mean, we can make some kind of an argument that, that what's good for the most people is what ought to be right, but that's really just a moral argument. There's not really a quantitative basis for saying that. It's just saying that I, this is the criterion that I'm going to choose to use is what's good for the most people. But that, and then so you have to have an idea of, well, what's good, right, what is beneficial, and then the most people, you have to have a notion of how many people there are. But the underlying question about whether that is a valid principle on which to operate, that's a moral question. Right? That comes extends out of a moral theory or a notion of the public good. That's not really a quantitative uh, oriented question. And sometimes we get to explanation that is based on quantitative analysis, but not always. So when we ask the question, we develop a, a model, for example, about why people voted for Joe Biden over Donald Trump or Donald Trump over Joe Biden. We think about their socioeconomic characteristics. We think about their racial and ethnic characteristics. We think about uh, where they live. We think about the uh, number of ads that they watched and the media to which they ex they're exposed. And we can develop a model that helps us predict why uh, people voted for one candidate or another. But sometimes our explanations are not quantitative. They might just be based upon something that we call participant observation. That is, we go and we carefully, in a nuanced, deep way, describe the process that's going on in a particular kind of political event. So the famous political scientist Richard Fenno spent many, many years studying individual members of Congress trying to understand why they did what they did and to, in doing so uh, in a way that is not necessarily quantitative, but that was clearly empirical because he was observing and describing what he saw. That's a different kind of question than what do we think the role of a representative is, which is a normative question. Now, these things are related to each other. I don't want you to get the sense that description, prescription, and explanation are compartmentalized from each other. They're separate questions. They're separate issues. Because description and explanation are often used to support or to evaluate prescriptive statements. For example, my concern over studying voter turnout extends out of my concern for the health of democracy. So let's take a, quest let's take a look at this kind of a set of questions and see how they relate to each other. Now, in this case, we can think about the prescriptive set of arguments surrounding how democracy is supposed to work. Now, the United States isn't a democracy, strictly speaking. We're a representative democracy. We're a republic. Still, a critical piece of any democratic system does involve large-scale citizens voting. And in general, people tend to see that higher voter turnout as a rule reflects a healthier kind of democracy. So when I was in college and graduate school in the 1980s and the 1990s, voter turnout seemed to be really in decline. And a major debate at that time was whether or not our democracy was failing. Well, now we have much higher turnout, 10% turnout more now than we did 30 years ago. And people are still debating whether so much voting and so much participation, it reflects a healthy democracy. So that's a different kind of set of debates um, that are related to people's normative concerns about how a representative democracy is supposed to work. But in the general sense, democracy is supposed to be healthier when more of its eligible citizens actually vote. So therefore, studying voting is important so that we know how healthy democracy is. Now, those are prescriptive arguments, right? The more, ci more citizens ought to vote, right? communicates an ideal state. It communicates the best we can do for a representative democracy is to have more of the citizens involved in the process. But that's not a quantitative question. That's just saying, it's just making an argument. A descriptive approach to this question would actually look at how many people voted in 2020 compared to how many could have voted. So we could say, well, we know that 100 million people voted. Uh, but we know that 130 million people could have voted. So then we can compare the number who did vote 
with the number who could have voted and make some kind of a, a discussion, uh, some kind of an evaluation of whether or not that matches with the, the idea of widespread citizen voting. Moreover, we can look at whether the number of people who voted or the percentage of people who voted in 2020 increased or decreased compared to previous years. And so we can look at voter turnout over time. Still, even though that's quantitative in nature, just finding that data and using it to describe the electorate as in terms of the percentage of people who vote, even though it's quantitative, that's still just description. That doesn't really get us to uh, understanding why that happened. For that, we need explanation. And so with explanation, we ask questions. Why did some people vote but not other people? There, there are a lot of people in the United States who are eligible to vote. Some of them didn't. Why? That's an interesting question. What are the correlates of those kinds of decisions that people make? Moreover, if voter turnout changes over time, it ebbs and flows over time, what accounts for that? Why is turnout higher in some years and lower in other years? Why is it higher in some periods of US history, but lower in other periods of US history? Why does voter turnout vary from country to country? Even in countries where there's very high voter turnout, it's not exactly identical. So why does that happen? That's where empirical political science comes in. We're finding the relationship between prescription, description, and explanation. So in this case, prescription is a discussion about what voter turnout ought to be like. That leads us to ask the questions and gather information about what voter turnout actually is. Once we have data about what voter turnout actually is and we collect more information about voters and political systems, then we can start to develop explanations based on observation and, and statistical relationships about why voter turnout is the way it is. These are three fundamentally different kinds of questions, even though we're all kind of still talking about the same thing. Finally, there's another relationship so we see that the prescriptive concerns lead us to ask certain questions and collect certain data and engage in certain projects. But then we can take the results of that get data gathering and those projects and we can return to our normative questions and we can evaluate them. So if we think the greater turnout is associated with a healthier democracy and we find out that turnout has increased, then we might be able to evaluate the premises of our arguments, uh, and we might be able to evaluate the health of our democracy and, uh, and other democracies. So in this case, we have a kind of a symbiotic a relationship between these three kinds of questions. It's not that one is better than the other. It's just that each of them plays a different role in our thinking about politics. So all of that is, to sum is in summary to say that there are different kinds of political knowledge when we start thinking about the research questions we have, and political science is a really diverse set of concepts, really diverse set of beliefs and uh, approaches. And so in this case, our course in this set of videos is focused on quantitative analysis, applying data in a way that helps us understand politics and policy better.